Did you hit the button? Hit the button. Oh, and man. Participants are streaming in. Good to see everyone. Welcome, welcome. We got people showing up. Uh, go ahead in the chat. Say hello. Who are you? Where are you coming from? Houston, you sound close, closer than normal. I am closer than normal. I'm actually in the Character Strong office, a rare day, the first time in over 100 days. Wait, you're here? I'm here. <laughs> Did you come in when I wasn't looking? Dude, I'm downstairs. <laughs> uh, welcome, folks. We got people coming in. Uh, looks like Addie's here from Alaska. That's super exciting. Uh, Nyla's here, an administrator at Einstein Middle School. Deb's here from Wisconsin. Just talk to Deb. Pennsylvania. That's great. Jennifer, Stanwood School District. Hi, Jennifer. Just talk to Jennifer. <laughs> Joyce is here from It's all my friends that I've been talking to. <laughs> yeah, they're all our, our friends. Suba's here from uh, KDISD, which is awesome. Suba was at our last training. Good to see you, Suba. Uh, Steve Robinson's here, Dean of Students. He doesn't tell us where from. He's just, I like that. It's very 007. <laughs> Dean of Students, from where? Everywhere. Aloha. Barbara's here from Texas. Hi, Barbara. We got Angie here from Odessa, our Missouri friends who uh, are amazing implementers. Justin's here from Washington, one of our uh, Character Strong champions. Hi, Justin, good to see you. Uh, Sharon is here. Sharon's asking, can we record this? Don't worry, we already yeah. have it. We will record it and send you a recording of it. Glad you're here. Hi, Kristen, from Baytown, Texas. We got Steamboat Strings, uh, <laughs> Strings, <laughs> Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Red leather. Red, yellow, light. <laughs> Both <strength laughs> That's a cool town, I've heard. Um, oh, hey, Jordan James, Archbishop Murphy High School from near my hometown, Everett, Washington. Robin's here from North Carolina. So fun to have so many of you in the building. Uh, really excited to share with you a bit today around what we know to be a critical topic as well as a frustrating topic for some of us. Uh, because when it comes to real culture change, we got to start with us as the adults. So I'm going to share myself uh, into a screen, load up these slides, hopefully you can see them. And because it's always good to double check, go ahead and uh, Suba, if you're listening, give this a yes if you can see the slides right now. Yes, got Lisa here. she's fast. Wow, very fast. <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, welcome everyone. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, uh, my name is Houston. I'm one of the co-founders of Character Strong. I'm here today with um, John, the other co-founder of Character Strong. We're at the Character Strong office, CS Central here. And uh, it's rare, John, that we get to do a webinar together. There's so much going on that anytime we get to present together is always a gift. It used to be everything that we did together. So it is a gift. And I'm so excited that you're in the same space. Um, excited to dig into this topic. And a couple of quick comments that came in, like, I can't view others' comments in the chat. That's on purpose. We want people to be able to ask whatever they want and not worry about it being public in that sense. So feel free to be messaging us. We have a team that will be pulling questions that you ask uh, into a document for us to have in one spot so that we don't miss them. And, uh, and then Paula... Hi, from Wenatchee, my hometown. Thanks for coming. That's awesome. Let's do this, Houston. Some webinar best practices. If you have any questions along the way, drop them into the chat. Uh, if you're here on Zoom, we're also live on Facebook. We have team members in both places pulling those questions. Uh, and we're excited that you're here. To get it out of the way, because it always gets asked, will we send out a recording of this? Yes. And will you get some of the slides? Absolutely. Awesome. And if you stay to the end, will there be a bigger giveaway? Yes. So that we'll see what happens. If you're here live and you stay to the end, we're giving away something cool today. So um, today we're talking about creating staff buy-in for social emotional learning. Uh, sometimes, even on accident, we think about SEL as a student only endeavor. In reality, one of our favorite lines from Dr. Clayton Cook is when it comes to school culture change, we are first and foremost in the business of adult behavior change, which means if we're going to work on social emotional learning for our students, we better be competent at it ourselves. If we're going to have our students buy in, we better start with the staff buy in. Uh, so let's start here, John. What is implementation? I know that organizationally, this is the thing that we're so passionate about. 
because there are plenty of programs digitally or physically that you can buy and they will sit on a digital or physical shelf and never get used because a program without implementation uh, is just another program, just another book. <laughs> right. and, and you actually say this really well because we get a lot of guidance. Um, I think one of the things you know, from Dr. Clayton Cook, who's one of our main higher ed uh, supports, uh, who is deep into the work of implementation. Uh, he always says that one of the things that makes us unique is that we care as much about the implementation as we do what's actually being taught because kids can't benefit from something they don't receive. Um, and so even this next slide has really resonated and you articulate it really well, Houston, with schools because a lot of them are like, yep, that's us. The first one, that's us. We've been doing that for years, right? And we need to change that. So yeah, talk us through these three pieces that are a part of implementation. Absolutely. I'm such a word person because words, right, our paradigms drive our practices. The way we think about things up here drives what we do out here. Uh, and so when it comes to implementation, I think sometimes we unintentionally think that implementation is simply just getting a program. And even if that program is proven to work, if we don't put the work into it, it's not going to work. <laughs> so uh, the mistake sometimes is we mistake implementation for diffusion. Diffusion uh, is letting it happen. It's the school that purchases the program, hands the password to its staff and says, all right, go. <laughs> it's letting it happen. It's that I want to take a big step back approach and I'm hoping that just by purchasing X, it's going to solve my problem. Uh, I've done this before in my life. That's where around New Year's you buy a gym membership and you think that purchasing it is going to make you stronger. <laughs> it does. How it works. I've tried it many years in a row. I have a lot of different gym. And in fact, it is more work to cancel that membership uh, than it is to buy it in the first place. Uh, and so diffusion when it comes to curriculum also doesn't work. The way hands off approach, the letting it happen, the hoping it'll happen um, won't actually drive the work forward. Uh, sometimes people confuse implementation for dissemination. Now, Dr. Cook would say that dissemination is actually an important piece of implementation, but it is not implementation itself. So dissemination, another way to translate that would be helping it happen. So mm, let's go back to the gym metaphor. Uh, at one point, I was really motivated. So I, um, I signed up with this guy that did personal training. He was a big dude. He was younger than me. And the first session we had was really encouraging. Uh, and really one of the biggest ways he helped me get to the gym was the simple text reminder. Hey man, you want to schedule something for this week? Pretty hands off, right? It wasn't an aggressive thing, but it was the reminder that I needed to put a free focus on it in my otherwise busy life. So dissemination is about helping it happen. And that is required actually for implementation, right? A leadership team who's helping drive the work forward um, also needs to disseminate materials regularly because we need to be reminded more than we need to be taught. So what does that look like in practice? Well, it looks like the team that says, hey, just a reminder, this week we have a lesson on blank. Uh, one of the reasons why we believe in this lesson is because blank. Make sure you take a look at this little part here and we're excited to see how it goes with your students. Send us an email with your success stories or your struggles, right? That dissemination piece is helping it happen by reminding or putting a focus on um, key ingredients over the course of any given week or month. That's different. Diffusion and dissemination are not actually implementation itself. Implementation is about making it happen. Right? There are so many things happening on any given campus that if someone is not explicitly in charge of making it happen, we always say it won't happen, right? You need a team of people who are dedicated to driving the work forward. What does making it happen look like in practice and function? Well, it looks like people meeting regularly to make sure that things are actually happening. It looks like people who are doing the work ahead of time to build capacity in our staff so that the work doesn't fall on its face the first day you get there. Can you imagine showing up to the gym and asking your trainer to have you use that machine that looks like the Terminator, that looks like the Transformers Optimus Prime? If I don't know how to use that machine and my trainer asked me to use that machine on day one, I'm gonna fall on my face. So we need to build capacity before we actually start to execute and implement. Uh, so implementation is about making it happen. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Yeah, and I'll even add just one thing to that, Houston, besides the fact that I love your gym uh, example that you keep coming back to, because um, it's so true. I implementation, another example is the best implementers 
as a part of doing that work early are having conversations with the key influencers on the staff that they already know what the response is going to be before they ever get to that place of like uh, being in front of the entire staff because they've done the work of not having to individually connect with every staff member but they know the key staff members that they need to be communicating with beforehand to be throwing things off of to be getting feedback before they ever get to that space so it's not a surprise right they're learning from them they're getting them in on that work because people support what they help to create so it's that type of thing that goes to that extra level when it comes to implementation. To use the gym metaphor, I need to start putting the workouts on my calendar. I need to start developing a rhythm, some habits around when I work out and for how long, recovery, pre-workout. Right? And as I start to build more and more habits over time, I don't try to adapt them all at once, which is the classic New Year's Eve resolution mistake, is I'm gonna eat better, work out more, run, swim, dance, stretch, you try to put it all at once, and then when we try to do everything, we end up doing nothing very well. So implementation is the intentionality of making it happen by chunking it, by getting small wins that add up to big wins over time. So today we're talking about buy-in, but sometimes I think these words, to go back to words, these words get collapsed a little bit, and I think it's important to talk about the difference, John. Readiness versus buy-in. You're on calls literally every single day with administrators and districts, uh, talking about implementation and buy-in comes up a lot. So sometimes we have to pre-correct readiness versus buy-in. What's the difference? Yeah, I would say probably 75% of calls this comes up in some way or another talking with um, schools. And uh, usually this is my approach. Um, to quote Brene Brown, um, we need to drill down on the invisible army. So if someone says, well, I think, we, I think we've got some staff buy-in issues. My first question is how many? And there's usually a pause. I'm like, no, how many? How many people actually are not like bought in? Like they're not, like they're against like doing whole child work and like infusing of social emotional learning. Like how many? Well, there's probably these like three or four staff members. And I'm like, okay, how many staff do you have? Well, there's like 85. Okay, you don't have a staff buy-in issue. You've got the critical mass. Now, do you have a staff readiness issue? Probably in many cases, because if you check the next slide, Dr. Clayton Cook always talks about this. 75 to 80% of implementation efforts have been estimated to fail as a result of organizational or staff readiness. It's more of did we actually make time to get the staff ready for this? Like, which means a lot of things, and we'll talk more about it in today's uh, webinar, but like time for professional development, time to dig in and actually not the 15 minute, you're good, right? But actually time to ask questions, dig in, familiarize ourselves with it. Um, and that we have a plan then for regular dissemination when it comes to it. So today's focus is on that. But I think in most cases, I would say the vast majority of cases, it's actually not a staff buy-in issue. Our experience being all around the country um, and now even world with many international schools utilizing Character Strong is it's not a buy-in issue, it's a readiness issue. That most staff know that deep down we need to do this work, but it's more a question of how do we do this work with everything else that's on our plate. So how do we know? Well, we have an implementation readiness checklist, right? Some simple guiding questions to help us think through uh, that sort of complex question. How do we know if we're ready? Well, is it just to put out our feelers? Yeah, of course, intuition and those conversations are a part of it. But how do we actually start to measure this thoughtfully? Uh, one of that, the quotes that you mentioned earlier from Dr. Cook, kids can't benefit from a thing that they don't receive. So how do we know if we're ready to deliver those things? Well, there's just three categories of this checklist uh, that we'll talk about today. First question series is about implementation leadership, the people in charge of driving the work forward. The second question is about, is about really culture and climate in the building. Is the school ready or prepared or open to adopting new things? And then question series three, we're talking about buy-in, beliefs, uh, and, and, and attitudes around this sort of content um, and how do we make sure that people are ready for that buy-in before we ever even try to get it in the first place. So we're gonna walk through a couple of the questions and add some context along the way. And uh, if you wanna be really participatory and um, have some thoughts around any of these or even wanna self-rate yourself in the chat, always just fun to sort of see where people think they're at um, and use this as a mini self-assessment um, to drive the work today.
So the first category, again, leadership within the building, the people driving the work forward. The leadership within the building is equipped with the knowledge and skills to effectively promote the uptake and use of the selected program or practice. Not at all, to some extent, to a moderate extent, or to a great extent. John, how do you see this playing out? Yeah, well, first, I even just want to mention this, like, there's a large number of times we know that the highest impact size is during the day to day is happening from like the, the teacher to student level. We know that from Hattie's right research, uh, as well as many others. But we also know this, like what is happening from that building leadership level has a huge influence, obviously, and impact on not just the success of this being implemented, but what is going on in the building. So when it comes to SEL work, a lot of times one of the biggest roadblocks is the leadership in the building. It's even understanding there's a big difference between leadership and management. And a lot of times principals might struggle on the leadership side. Leadership is the relational work in so many cases that is connected to taking these like reviewed things and actually like making it happen, right? To go to that implementation work. Um, and a lot of times this is the part that's ignored. It's like, why isn't it working? Well, sometimes it can come literally down to the building leadership level. So this is important. When we look at leadership within the building, number one is equipped with the knowledge and skills to effectively promote the uptake and use of the selected program or practice. The best schools that implement character strong, their administrators are leading the charge. They're showing up to one of our regional and or like now virtual kind of national trainings. They know what it is. They can speak to it. They can ask or like answer questions that come around it before you ever get to that staff PD day. Too many times the administrators are learning at the exact same pace as the staff and that's a problem. Yeah, I've been in a few rooms, John, maybe you have as, too, as well, when we do professional development where they'll send the staff and they'll step out because they have other things to do. That's an indication that they think this is for their staff and not for themselves. Number two, leadership within the building is prepared to prioritize the new program or practice as a work in the building. Priorities, we talk about that a lot. Yeah, I mean, and part of the leadership when it comes to this is like the idea of, and we'll probably talk more about it you know, later, but it is how many, how many initiatives are happening? And there's always going to be more than one. Every school, you're not alone in that, right? There's so much on our plate. Well, yes, welcome to the club. Everybody's got a lot on their plate. Now, how do we make sure that we are putting the spotlight on what, if you want to use, like, I guess it would be an analogy, right, of like uh, the stage or the metaphor, right? What's center stage? What side stage, right? Like there's things that are happening, but what is literally center stage or what is the foundation of the house while the other pieces are still happening? Have we made that crystal clear? Because we would argue, and a lot of research would argue, that the foundation is the social emotional supports, not just for students, but also for staff. Absolutely. So what have we done to prioritize it? Think about all the things that need to be a part of, like what does it look like to prioritize? Time, resources, right? Time during the day, right? For things to happen are all like simple pieces that are a part of that. Leadership within the building has received sufficient training in the program or practice. We were alluding to this earlier. Uh, we see oftentimes that a, a building might just send a, a staff and not come themselves. And uh, like you were mentioning, John, we've seen the most success in buildings where administrators are a part of that tier one team, a part of that culture team to drive the work forward. Uh, and we've also seen that to be true at the district level, right? We've had some directors of instruction, some assistant or superintendents from directors of counseling um, who show up to these trainings because they want to understand how this work plays out district wide. And that sort of alignment, right, when we can cast that vision as a, at a wider level, well, you're operating on more cylinders yeah. yeah i think even on this one too houston it's like uh, i frustrated having been at the district level where i oversaw this work as the program administrator for the whole child it was a lot of times like curricula companies where it's like here it is good luck it's like even like offering it like do we have something that does prepare the leadership of the building to best so it's not like well there's these videos that are on the site like you can find it here it's like, no, I'm never going to get to that because there is an incredible amount on administrators plates. It needs to be something that is offered to them in many different like opportunities and ways. And I think that is something that makes us unique is that focus on that, that we can train those uh, building leaders so that they are equipped. Leadership within the building is committed to protecting training time. 
for staff to learn about the program or practice. Protecting time. I heard you use that line earlier this morning, John. What does that mean? Well, even just this idea, I mean, even today I've been on calls and it's like, well, you know, we don't really have any time in the staff. I'm like, well, what are you doing during those days? And it's usually all academic, right? And or, and or nuts and bolts related where half the time the nuts and bolts stuff could be delivered in a different way, but we just got to get out of our own like way of this is the way we've always done it and realize that sometimes half of that could be delivered in a way where we treat teachers like professionals and say, you're responsible to learn these things, right? So here it is in this way. If you have any questions, send it to me. But beyond that, it's the idea of when we understand that this is the foundational work, we make time for it and understand that if we're doing the, the professional development around the social emotional learning, it also is combining the staff climate culture work that is so critical. Like it brings it together. There's multiple value adds for making time and most schools do something like that. They know that they gotta do a little bit of the staff work to start the year because this is who's gonna be working together. Well, what if we could bring that together and be more intentional with what we're already doing and fuse in how we are going to bring in the social emotional learning piece. But it is literally committed and that takes leadership. Without leadership, it's never going to be made like time for or prioritized. Yeah, we like to say that uh, leadership development is character development. And I would say that social emotional learning is relational learning. And especially coming back this fall, um, we're able to combine those two as foundational needs in our building. The relationships staff to staff to support work that is harder than ever and the social emotional learning to role model it for our students who need those coping skills, who need to cultivate that resilience with a lot of the new normals moving forward. And I'll warn, I mean, I, I think people that are on this call, Hughes, are gonna like understand this, that's why they're here. But if we're not making time for this work for both the staff SEL and the student to start this year in particular, I don't know what to tell you. Like you're gonna get what you get, like, and it's not going to be good because it, it, tier two and tier three is now tier one and that's staff included. We have to make time for this. Leadership within the building is knowledgeable of how to implement supportive accountability procedures to encourage staff to change their behavior consistent with the new program or practice. We talk about this often, John, leadership is high expectations with high supports. What does that mean to you? Yeah, I think one is changing the mentality of accountability being top down. Right. There are times when that does. I would say that like because we have a we believe in like a servant leadership model of like the way that we lead that like resorting to power, like it's understanding that at times it happens, but it should be a, a last resort and it should be a sign that your influence is broken down in some way or another. If it's a you have to, um, it's it, it, it should be cause for reflection. Right. And that there's a problem here. What do we need to do to come back? I think uh supportive accountability is coming up with fun ways we know that accountability can be a part of like doing it in a real positive proactive way um the school that we talk about a lot that we love they wanted to create accountability at the beginning of the year around a committed adult relational practice of like greeting at the door right in a specific way and instead of saying we're going to be walking around with a clipboard and seeing who's there or who's not there no 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 they made a game out of it they said at the staff meeting at the end of this month we're gonna play a game and it's gonna be a game of Texas Hold'em. And people are like, what? That's weird. And it's like, no, here's what's gonna happen. Our administrators, counselors are gonna be walking around the building during passing periods at different times. If you're not there every time, that's all right. Sometimes you might have to connect with a student. Um, we get that. But if you are at the door, we're gonna just have a deck of cards that we hold open. And if you're at the door, just take one, right? And some of you are gonna show up to the staff meeting at the end of the month and you're gonna have 30 cards. Some of you might show up with four cards. Those with 30 might have a better chance to get a royal flush. And what they actually won was pretty legit. It was like they had to be at school still, but it was like the principal on a day that they like communicate together was going to teach their classes for a day so they'd get a whole day in building, but of like extra prep, which like time is like pretty valuable to any educator. So they had all sorts of fun traction around it. Well, it also was accountability to be at the door, people are walking around, but instead of like, you have to, it was in a fun, supportive, like accountability, but also an understanding of we get it. If you're not there every time, that's great, but we are gonna be walking around and we're gonna do it in this fun way. And that is accountability in a different way. So we gotta think differently. And what if we could put a different spin on how we do that accountability? The harder accountability is actually having the courage to have conversations. And too many times that's not happening, right? I noticed that this is or is not happening. Let's talk about it. Yeah. And how do I support you getting better? Yep. 
And one of my favorite examples, uh, middle school down in California, they do the weekly, we have weekly staff challenges to have adults role model their own character building, call them the character dares, staff character dares. And uh, one of my favorite examples is that students come into the um, staff meeting and they're the ones that challenge the staff. So instead of staff to staff accountability, we're creating student to staff accountability, which is just another way to frame encouraging behavior change by not having the top down, but instead that student to staff accountability. Leadership within the building is able to effectively recognize and acknowledge staff for efforts to implement the new program or practice with fidelity. Yeah, I think- Kindness, kindness yeah. is, uh, Mother Teresa says, <laughs> um, right, if there's only two things you did every day, pay attention to people, or people crave attention and appreciation more than they crave bread. And so if there's only two things we were able to do every day as leaders in the building was, celebrate people and give them our attention, we'd be off to a good start. Yeah, and let me give you an example of the difference, a difference maybe between dissemination and implementation, which we might have said this at the beginning. Uh, it's understanding too, it's not just about implementation. Both dissemination and implementation are needed. We need to both be helping it happen and making it happen throughout the year. Um, an example of this would be um, a principal who has at the monthly staff meetings, ways that they're recognizing individual staff members, right? So there's a shout out thing, whatever. That's some helping that happen. That's cool. There's ways they're recognized. Here would be an implementation, <clears throat> making it happen. The principal who each week is going in and teaching one of the advisory lessons. They actually go into different like staff members. Hey, this week I'm going to co-teach it with you. Or I'm going to lead it because that principal now knows both the things that are like working well, what's not working well. They can literally speak to the problems that maybe staff are experiencing and then more effectively be able to acknowledge, right? What's the, what, what needs to be ramped up here? Where do we need more supports? Because they literally are doing the work, right? They're sacrificing that 30 minutes once a week and they've got firsthand knowledge. And because of that are far better able to acknowledge the struggles and or effectively recognize the effort that is being putting in. That would be an example in terms of leadership or a difference. Well said. The final one for this category, leadership within the building has been able to establish trust with staff that impacts their willingness to learn something new. You know, they've done surveys in businesses and uh, schools, organizations worldwide for 30 years asking a consistent question, which is what is the number one quality you want in your leaders? And the number one answer for 30 years, they don't want to be able to trust them. It's a reminder that this work is all about relationships. So how does this one speak to your experience, John? Yeah, well, we break it down three ways in the triangle of trust in our trainings that we've done, right? Which is empathy. Do, does the staff feel that you have empathy for us and what we're going through? Uh, authenticity. Are you real? Are you authentic in what you're bringing to us? And then consistency. And I think what this means is the difference between leadership and management once again, right? I think we have really good building managers a lot of times. Um, uh, one way to look at we manage things, we lead people. So for a lot of building principles, one of the things that they do with like character strong support is they do the admin character dares, which are once a week, different relational moves, because what it does is there's these little consistent actions that they're demonstrating where the staff start to experience a more intentional consistency in the relationship work uh, that is needed. And that builds trust over time versus um, an example of the high school senior in Texas when I was presenting and we're in the auditorium and the principal comes on for this day long like student leadership retreat and he's like, oh, that's who our principal is. I'm like, wait, what grade are you? And he's like 12th grade. And I'm like, you don't know who your principal is? He's like, no, that's the first time I've seen him. I'm like, wait, you, you've been here for four years? He's like, yeah, like I've never seen him. He's never been in an assembly, he's never been whatever. Now it was a high school 4,000, but I'm like, whoa. Right? Do you, like, is your, is your principal even out there? Now, someone asked, leadership, do you mean building principal or like the, the building leadership team? I mean, both. I mean, the building principal really does matter, like specifically that person, but it also is the building and it might be the building leadership team. Assistant principals could be a couple counselors, teacher leaders as a part of this as well. So consistent relational work that needs to happen. So shifting from that leadership team, which I know you're, we're all passionate about, John, your, your master's is in organization leadership. Uh, it's, we've, the, I know you through the leadership world and we spend a lot of time 
actually doing a lot of pre-correction around that idea of what is actually leadership. What does it mean to lead? Some people confuse leadership and management. Sometimes people think that uh, someone else is the leader in the building when in reality, they're the one should be leading the charge. So that distinction is critical. But now we move from sort of that leadership team to culture and climate, which we're also very passionate about. We talk about culture is behavior, climate is a feeling. Uh, so when we're talking about the implementation climate of the school, one of the questions we might ask is, is it a place where it feels open to take on new and effective programs and practices? Are we even open to the idea? Yeah, we get in the way of this sometimes. Yeah, I mean, with this one too, we don't need to, need to go too deep. It, it, it's just more of this. If it's not, why is it not? And it's not always the same reason. Yeah. Right. Let me just give you two examples. Right. One reason why it may not is that we've done this before and there's never clear like messaging and vision being led from the building leadership level. It just kind of gets dumped on us and it's diffusion every time. That could be a reason why they're not open. <laughs> um, another thing could be that it literally is initiative overload. There are too many initiatives happening, which takes once again leadership to say, Here's what we're gonna be stripping away to make sure that this is center stage. And it's even articulated, this is center stage. These are also high priorities, but this is literally center stage. These are secondary priorities, but still happening. Is that actually being articulated? Both of those reasons though, right? Initiative overload and being able, we need to do an audit. We're taking this out, we're taking this out, we're taking this out. Because if something comes in, Dr. Clayton Cook talks about this a lot, then a lot of times, something needs to go out. And a lot of times that doesn't happen. It just keeps being added on more, 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 more. Well, that makes sense that they may not be open to it. Yeah, program fatigue and then the mentality that starts to happen of this too shall pass, right? We've done this so many times. This comes in, it's a nine month cycle and then it's gone. Why would I invest in something that's just gonna go out again the next year? Yep. Wouldn't be open to something that I've, in the past I've given it a shot and then we move on to something new and then we get into this nine month cycle. The implementation yep. climate of the school is characterized by staff supporting one another to implement new programs or practices. Yeah, like, yeah, it, 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 the, I think there's one later that we're going to go to more like specific, but even this, like, I like to share that one of the very best schools that we've ever seen implement Character Strong when we went in and we're interviewing staff, because we like said, we know that the curriculum by itself does not make this impact. We even look at it as a holistic approach. The adult relational practices, school-wide integration, what are we doing with a smaller group of students that are representative of the student population to like leverage the student to student relationships. So we went in and we said, tell us, what was it that was so critical to your success? And the, the two things that we kept hearing time and time again, one was a common language, which means they've made time for that. They've built that common language through training, ongoing touch points. The other was this, they said, it wasn't just our laser focus on the relational work happening from staff to students, just as much was the staff to staff work. And this line really resonated with me. I actually look forward to coming to work every single day. They said, it's not that the work is any easier, it's as hard as it's ever been, but I actually am looking forward to coming each day. And that part is huge. How many times do we get in each other's way? Are we, do we even have a staff that's supportive of each other in general, right? Before we even get to like being supportive of implementing any new programs or practices. Implementation climate of the school is open to providing feedback to one another to improve the delivery of effective programs and practices. It's one of our over goals. Our goal, our, our character dares we offer staff often is we call it breakfast of champions. We ask people to practice the process of getting feedback because not everyone's very open to it. Yeah, and what, what's our system, too, of, of regular feedback, right? Mm -hmm. On the collective as well as the individual, if it's a one-time thing that we do every once in a while because the problem has, like, blown up versus do we have a consistent method, right, of getting feedback where this is the way that we do things? Well, doing consistent feedback, a system for that, um, eventually creates more and more openness to being uh, willing to provide that feedback more authentically. The implementation climate of the school is characterized by staff feeling that there are sufficient supports available to them to take on and implement new practices. <laughs> I'll, I'll visit, they're just a classic, right? I don't laugh because they're very real, but I laugh because like they are so, like this is so spot on, right? Why it's on the readiness checklist. The, the number one on this to not go too deep. 
This is all about the team. This is the, the, the school who just does the PD and then there's no team that's guiding the work forward. And so the next time we talk about it is if there's a major problem or the next year when we maybe do PD again or don't do it again, right? Versus the school who has the team who each month is meeting and guiding and providing the supports, getting feedback, removing roadblocks ongoing. That's the difference here. Do we actually have a set of supports? Well, usually sufficient supports means that you've got a team guiding it forward who's even identifying what supports are specifically needed for your school because they're not always the same. Different schools have different needs and different levels of readiness. Implementation climate of the school is non-judgmental towards staff who need and or seek help to improve the implementation of classroom practices. Stop making me look bad, Houston. Like by, by being so passionate about this, you're making us all look bad. Like, will you stop it? And how yeah. many times have teachers experienced that, especially young teachers who are passionate? You're making us all look bad. You need to dial it down a notch. Yeah. You're That's toxic. Your enthusiasm is toxic. <laughs> but, and again, we laugh, but we know it's very real. We know that there are energy vampires in schools who maybe they just, they're getting into their habits and they've been doing it a long time. And so they're being asked to change, which is hard for any of us, especially once we build up the calcium deposits on our habits. Uh, but, but do we, have we cultivated a culture where proactivity and enthusiasm uh, around this work is encouraged and celebrated, brought forward as models of what this work looks like. Yeah, to get technical on this one, Houston, too, I think it's really learning to identify. Like some people go, well, how do I change that? Well, one of the ways you can do it is who are the most influential staff like in your building? And what I mean by influence is not just those who are always the most excited. No, whose voice carries the most weight? Who really has? the influence in your staff and are you going to them and doing the work with a smaller group of staff who are really the influential and sometimes it's hard work to start to change that because if they change attitude reflects leadership right you don't have to change everybody to get the system to change but are we doing the work on the key influencers and working with them to get on board what is that going to take sometimes it takes messy work because we're human beings who have feelings so we got to actually dig into that like learn from actually listen find out what the roadblock is. And if you can turn some of those staff members, this can change real fast, but they're the key. And are we actually having those conversations and going to them to seek to understand first? A little bit more of a zoomed out level, implementation climate in the school values the implementation of new programs or practices that show evidence of working. Do we, do we believe in, in this? Do we think that this is our job? Or do we think about this as a quote unquote, another thing on our plate? And we talk about it here strong, the paradigm shift that is so critical is moving things like social emotional learning away from a quote unquote, another thing on our plate to becoming the understanding that this is the plate. This is the foundational work upon which we build the rest of the house. If we can't do this work well, then we're gonna actually lose a lot of time uh, in the academic pursuit where we think we don't have the time. Climate of the school is overwhelmed and overloaded with taking on new programs or practices. A little bit of an inversion. So if you're taking the test, these are ones that you gotta be <laughs> paying close attention to. Uh, but it's a little bit of what you talked about before, right? Program fatigue. Yeah, and this goes to the, like you really need the district and building leadership level of are we doing the work at like, and it should be annual, right? At a minimum where we're taking a look. Are we, do we have initiative overload? Because initiative overload is going to definitely create more, um, you know, overload feeling on the staff. If something's coming in, something has to go out, right? And, it, it, and unless you want to continue to experience the same old thing, right? And so it's really leading that, articulating that well. Um, and then it's understanding that we have to do the adult work first. Like the probably hottest product, so to speak, that people are engaging with us on right now is our on-demand PD that includes an entire course on adult SEL. It's like stress coping resiliency skills for adults, for educators. And classified and certified staff are working through it even right now before the school year starts um, because they know we gotta do this work ourselves and understand stress and understand what we need to do and things that strategies that we can do to be better ourselves because we're impacted just like our students are. Um, and so it's, it's doing the work with staff as well as looking at what, like in our system, what kind of a load is on them 
Um, and just because we've got a lot going on doesn't mean that we shouldn't do SEL, mm -hmm. right? Like that's like, it's the foundation, right? Like this, look at the research. So what then needs to go? And that's making tough decisions. Yeah. The implementation climate of the school involves a high amount of respect to staff who are able to put in the effort to learn and implement new and effective programs or practices. This is what you were alluding to earlier. Absolutely. Yeah, I want to pull one too. I'll just initially like answer it too right in the moment. Houston is good at saying this is also important, but initiative overload is almost impossible to avoid given the nature of how we are doing school this year. It's all new. I would absolutely agree. And so once again, that's why leadership matters. And so when you think about it, one of the biggest mistakes that that teams will make, that leadership will make, is they try to just like, we need to be doing it all right at the beginning. Go, right? And it's like overload. Like a really effective model would be, how is that team going to gradually layer in, bit by bit, this work, and they're thinking out more than the next nine months. So where are we trying to get by the end of the year, by the end of next year, by the end of that? And we're going to do a real gradual layered approach instead of like, fire hose that's not effective and that's why the team matters without the team guiding it fire hose will happen right or just indifference will happen because i'm not going to do it yeah. so i think that's important involves a high what were you saying involves a high amount of respect for staff let's see staff believe that it's worth their time yeah if we don't hit the why this is going to be definitely one more thing on the plate we have to hit the why really hard yeah this moves into the educator buy-in component beliefs and attitudes right what i believe in assumptions, my beliefs about a thing are going to shape my actions inside of that structure. So do staff believe that it's worth their time and energy to implement new programs and practices? Right? Do I first and foremost have a belief in this actually working? Do I understand the why well enough to want to do the what? Second yeah, and, one. and it's not assuming that, well, of course staff know the why. Don't ever assume that. We need to be reminded more than we need to be taught, right? And sometimes we need to face it's like, well, that should be only happening in the home. There's a lot of ways that we can challenge that while still understanding that, of course, we want the home to be a part of it. It takes a village, though, right? And just like, let's look at it from that holistic lens. And if we want what's best for our students, all of our students, it's really hard to ignore what the research is showing and saying, right? And, and so that part is really, really important. Don't ever assume that they know the why. You got to keep coming back to it. Are they willing and committed to implementing the new program or practice? What does it mean to be committed to doing this? Do they understand what that commitment is? Because I think that's a key piece of the puzzle. Implementation science would tell us it's a three to five year timeline for something to stick, for new normals to truly take hold. And if I am saying I'm ready to implement this and I don't understand that we're actually looking at this on a longer time horizon, it's important for staff to understand what we're signing up for and why it's important. And if I don't understand the why before I sign up, then that three to five years is going to feel like a very long time. Mm -hmm. Staff who are the primary implementers of the practice program have favorable attitudes, view it as helpful, believe that it'll produce desired outcomes, see it as an improvement upon existing practices towards it. Right? What are our beliefs about how this thing's going to work? Yeah, it's taking the time to do that. It's even uh, staff who have done that, made time for the work. They'll even do uh, like staff uh, beliefs and attitude type survey they'll share those results because sometimes one way to help to turn it is to say hey by the way 85 percent of our staff believes this and those who maybe aren't believing that are like oh i'm in the small like group in the school who actually is like struggling with this 85 percent believe that mm, interesting sometimes facing that data is important absolutely some of my favorite research from dr jamil zaki out of stanford on the psychology of empathy he says that norming is a really big deal. If we can show people that they are in the minority when it comes to beliefs or assumptions, that's a powerful exercise. So putting that forward, that 85% say that this is important is actually a data point that pushes it towards more people believing it's important. Yep. Staff believe that it is their professional responsibility to take on and implement new programs and practices to enhance outcomes for students. That's a cool one, that's a tough one. Yeah, it's understanding that students are different than they were 30 years ago for your veteran staff, right? That true education means lifelong learning. It means understanding that it's always growing, always changing. Am I up on what's like, what's fresh, what's new? What are the needs of my students, 
right? And then going to work on that. Do you have that buy-in? And that once again, usually in many cases is a direct reflection of how it's being led. Is there even a culture overall ongoing of this type of belief um, and attitude? And that uh, takes time to develop. Staff have favorable attitudes towards a continuous improvement process to achieve desirable outcomes for students in the school. Do they think and understand the connection between social emotional learning, character development, relationship building, and academic performance? Yeah, even the, uh, the leadership in the building who understand that a good is the enemy of great. So they stop pushing because, yeah, things are pretty good here. Yeah, we're good. Really? <laughs> Right, like, or are we always, how can we improve, right? How can we improve? There's always better ways that we can be better for all of our students and that is a mentality, right? That is a constant like system of how you set things up. Staff have difficulty buying into implementing any new program or practice. If it's a, the attitudinal thing on a higher level, sometimes we think that it's an individual program when in reality it's on a, a zoomed out level. People are struggling to buy into anything new because of fatigue, overwhelm, anxiety, exhaustion, all the things. Lack of leadership at times, it could be a lot of reasons. Staff have belief barriers that will likely interfere with the uptake and use of the new program and practice. Readiness versus buy-in. Isn't that a good uh, verbiage, belief barriers? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's doing the work of removing those barriers. One, do you know what they are? Have you done the work to identify? And then two, do you have a, a team? that is going to work on removing as many of those as possible and then articulating what they've done to remove those obstacles, right? That they're making time for that work. We just did hard work, but it's so important, right? Yeah, uh, I love the work we are, we're doing right now with, with Katie School District down in Texas. We just did some work with their implementation teams. And I, um, one of the slides that we worked through uh, with teams, especially people who are in year two or three of Character Strong is hitting roadblocks on the head, right? So one of our big processes in our lessons is called the character dare process. And we went right into it. We said, what we know, right? These are going to be some of the things you're seeing from students who are resistors in your classroom. So let's actually talk about it as a staff. What have you seen worked? What do you do, John, to help when this thing happens? And what we discovered even in a very small group is that the collective wisdom of passionate educators is always going to outdo any, you know, sort of pre-recorded recommendations we could make. Yeah. Educators who are passionate about this find ways to smash those roadblocks, those belief barriers, and tapping into our staff to bring those voices forward, I think is an important exercise. And actually acknowledging the barriers as they're happening, as opposed to getting to the end of the year and saying, well, I don't think kids did any of it. Right? If we wait to acknowledge those, then we miss out on an opportunity to actually dismantle the beliefs that are overcomable with the collective wisdom. Yep. All right, so we're ready. <laughs> we have some collective staff readiness. We have 80% of our staff who's sort of on board, ready to move. So how do we go from readiness to buying? How do we go from ready to actually rocking it? I just love that you love alliteration that it had to be two R's. <laughs> it had to be. Absolutely. <laughs> Like that's too jumping. great, two C's. Look at this, everybody. Convenience, compassion. There's two, or oh, I'm seeing a the theme. <laughs> uh, I wanna talk through uh, three things that I think that we integrate into our professional development, um, into a lot of our work that um, help with the buy-in component. The first one, one of the biggest you know, belief barriers for staff would be, I don't have time. Right, that's a huge one. Uh, and one of my favorite articles from the Wall Street Journal is titled, Are You As Busy As You Think? It's a great title and it pushes. It pushes and begs you to reframe. It says, what if you were I never again allowed to say, I don't have time for something? What if you had to phrase it, even in your brain, like this? It's not my priority. It's not, I, I don't have time to go to the gym, might be, my body or my physical health is not my priority. I don't have time to eat better. Well, my gut health, my, my, my body is not my priority. Uh, I don't have time for this conversation right now. Our relationship is not our priority. We don't have time for social emotional learning. We got too much else going on. Well, the emotional well-being of our students and staff is not our priority. And that reframe is a really important distinction that I think um, 
helps us remind ourselves that what we give our time to is what we value. And we make time for that which is most important. The simple story uh, or, or actually research that um, brings this quote to life for me is from the 1970s Princeton Theological Seminary School study. They took a group of students over here into building A and told one half that they were going to give a practice sermon on the parable of the Good Samaritan, a story about helping strangers in need. They told the other half of students over here in building A that they were going to give a practice speech on job opportunities in the seminary field. They had time to prepare in building A, and in between building A and building B, the researchers intentionally planted someone in the middle along their path, who was obviously in need. What the study was curious about was, would the people who were actively thinking about kindness, actively thinking about stopping to help strangers in need, would they be more likely to stop and help this stranger in need? And what the research uncovered was no. Is that the actual biggest determining factor into whether or not someone stopped to help was how much of an, a rush they felt like they were in how much time they felt like they had to get from building A to building B. Which is a reminder to me that convenience, more than anything, is the enemy of compassion. That having time is always gonna be one of our biggest barriers to the things that we know are really important. But if we don't make time for them, they never happen. Because this work is complicated. It's hard, it's occasionally messy, it's often vulnerable and uncomfortable and challenges old habits and old paradigms. And what we know is we will prioritize other things that feel more concrete, more accessible, less vulnerable, well ahead of these things, unless we've changed our paradigm around time, unless we prioritize the emotional well-being of our students and staff. Otherwise, convenience will always stand in the way. Yeah, it's interesting making time for it. I, I've shared this before with some, maybe uh, some have even heard it. I think I might've told it on one of our uh, podcasts um but this idea of when we make time for it what happens um in just last august it was a full kind of district pd in a very small rural um uh a town uh in the state that i'm in and we spent the first 90 minutes really hitting the why really hard of the work and then getting staff interacting connecting making time for that and on the first break, I will never forget it. There was like this uh, veteran educator who's like kind of walk in from her seat. She's coming right past in front of me. I don't know if it was on the way to the snack table or the bathroom. Um, and she like makes eye contact and she's like, Sonny, I've been in, this or been in this district for 35 years and I feel more closely connected to the people in this room in the last 90 minutes than all 35 of those years combined. And at first I got excited. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Thanks for saying that. And then she left and I'm like, wait a minute, that's a problem. Are you kidding me? 90 minutes? But then I take a step back. And I'm like, this makes sense. How many times do we never do this work? Because, you know, oh, that's, just the, that's the touchy feely stuff. That's just the fluffy stuff. I just want everybody that's with us today to sit with that statement from a 35 year veteran educator who literally was bouncing past me in the front of the room, how excited she was because we were built to be relational and this work is not just for our students. Are we actually making time? We can learn more about another staff member an hour of intentional play and conversation than maybe a decade of casually passing each other in the hallway and maybe saying good morning to each other at most. What does that look like in practice? Well, knowing that coming back to school is gonna happen in person or in virtual or some hybrid of the two we're working on building new lessons, uh, especially the secondary level to replace in some ways some of the traditional advisory lessons that we have. And uh, one of the things we're excited about is the opportunity to be creative, new ways to be relational. I wanted to showcase one of those new ideas. Uh, in fact, here's a simple way to build relationships, um, student to student, staff to student, staff to staff. Let's do it right now between John and I. Would someone in the chat choose a mystery box that will reveal a photograph. Whatever photograph comes on screen, we will have to respond to. Someone says uh, B6. B6. Yeah. Right. right in the middle. <laughs> John? Uh, uh, okay, the, the, the first thing that comes to mind is that even though this is not a chihuahua, I understand that. But this little dog, right? This is a pug, right? 
But yeah. like my son right now, who's five, like for whatever reason, desperately wants a chihuahua. And I am not going to allow him to have a dog. I can't even take care of myself right now. Um, but this is what reminds me. Every time, if he even sees this dog, he thinks it's a chihuahua and he wants a chihuahua. And so like that right now is my life is like navigating the whole I want a puppy. And don't, don't think I'm a bad dad because I'm not giving a puppy yet. It's just my current reality. <laughs> Understood. How about you? <laughs> uh, you we'll go, choose one for me from the chat, John. Uh, let's see, 5B. 5B, yeah. B5? Yeah, 5B. Or B5. Yeah, we got books, a lot of books. Um, uh, I'll, I'll share this. I uh, just, in my email this morning, got the second pass on the book that I'm releasing this fall. Uh, it's my first published book. It's called Deep Kindness. It's being published by Tiller Press, which is a Simon & Schuster uh, imprint, which is super exciting. The due date is uh, 9 22. So mark on your calendars. My first published book, Deep Kindness, is coming out September 22nd. So I hope that my book is going to be in a bookstore just like this. But hopefully one of Just like this? This is a really cluttered one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But mine's going to be in the window. <laughs> That's awesome. Super excited about that, by the way. Love so you, that I got to read it already. <laughs> you can see how even something as simple as this activity can help us learn new things about each other. Um, and you can use this with your staff, you can use this with your students, a practical way to put a focus on connection. And as a reminder, it doesn't always have to take 30 minutes. It doesn't always have to be a big complicated activity. Sometimes it's just the prompts to put us into action in sharing. Yeah, this is, these types of tools you probably mentioned are gonna be things that are included, not only in our curricula going in, we're creating virtual um, type of lessons that build in the really because we're all about relationships so let's use our expertise and even how do we can we do that virtually to provide really simple tools for your staff to use we're doing that with our lessons as well as uh, providing some of these tools that are relaunching relationally roadmap training coming up in July and August as I think you mentioned there so Houston we've got some why statements here but I think here's what I think we should do I do have a call in, in five minutes with another school who is digging into this work. I think this idea of here's one example of a why, we talk about these a lot, the idea that we're built to be relational yet more isolated than ever before, hammering these types of things home with staff and how incredibly important it is. So it's not just like one more thing on our plate because it's hard to say that when we really understand the why. Um, but we do have some questions that were in the chat. Yeah. And we have a giveaway. That's right. And usually that giveaway comes from someone who had the courage to ask a question. So our team will put a name who, of someone who asked a question in the chat. Thank you for participating. And I'm gonna give you at least two minutes of rapid fire. And then if you want to um, finish up with anything that might be left from the, uh, the document or we can uh, send it off, but we do have the training that we're giving away, which is our equity implementation and empathy training, uh, bringing some experts together uh, on those two days to really dig deeper into this type of work, including the readiness checklist. Um, so a couple, couple thoughts as, as a few people are mentioning in the chat, where do we get more of these relational strategies? Uh, well, July 23rd, we have our first um, relaunching relationally roadmap training, which includes a lot of very practical ways to put a focus on those relationships. Uh, you can learn more about that in our past webinars. Um, and Krista just dropped a link to register for the training. It's going to be awesome. Um, but the giveaway today is for our EIE training, the Equity Implementation and Empathy, the two-day conference in August. Um, yeah. Super excited to bring some experts together. Um, and uh, does, does our team have something in the, the document there, John, to give yeah. away? Yeah, I can share it. And a couple of even people started to ask like, hey, because maybe it's even the first time, do you have like bundles where if we have one district wide or multiple schools? Yes. Anytime more than one school comes together, um, we have multiple types of discounts that go for that and district wide bundling. So um, I would say the easiest way is just to directly email me since I'm on those calls every single day. Um, and my email is just john, J-O-H-N, at characterstrong.com. Um, so feel free to email me on that. Uh, but the winner, and then we'll see a couple of questions. The winner today is Joyce Zer. I probably said that wrong. So Joyce, I apologize on your last name, Z-E-H-R, Joyce Zer. We'd love to give you a free registration to this equity implementation and empathy training. If you can't make it, 
then you can gift it to another building leader um, if those dates don't work for you, but we'd love to welcome you. That train's gonna be an awesome day. All right, Houston, I have a minute. Lots of questions. Oh, let me just hit a couple real quick. Um, let's see, looking here. It says, in year one, if the buying and implementation efforts weren't as strong as they should have been, how do we recover? One with authenticity. Hmm. You acknowledge it, right? Here's what didn't go well, and here's why, right? And then have a, and then you start, right? Which is here is our plan now, and here's how we're going to support it, and then you actually follow that up. That's a deeper combo, but on a basic level, you own it, right? Here's what went didn't go well. Here's why it didn't go well, and then bring them a plan, um, and then actually act upon it. What is good verbiage to differentiate leadership versus management? We uh, manage things. We lead people. Leadership's all about the relationship work. Management's more on the tasks, right? What's the schedule for next year? Um, what's the, you know, this procedure? Uh, we manage, we, both are needed, by the way, right? It's not saying that management's bad. Both are needed, task and relationship, task and relationship. But I always say we manage things, we lead people. Um, will I be able to access the chats later? Not the chats, but you can chat with us if you want. Reach out to us, I'd love to talk with you and I can have a lot of chatting that can happen. <laughs> um, when you say leadership, do you mean principals or the leadership team? I got that at both, right? But really specifically the building leader matters. Uh, as an in-school suspension staff, only having different five to 10 students in the classroom at a time for everything from taking tests to doing classwork because their normal classroom is too loud or disruptive behavior. How can we implement SEL and or other character strong steps? I think little bit by bit, don't overwhelm it. So we could talk about multiple ways that this can be customized where you're doing like little pieces and then like gradually build it over time instead of like thinking it needs to be happening the same way it's happening in other classes. Uh, can you share with me the staff PD for SEL? Uh, I think maybe that is the on-demand. So we can drop that in there. The page, maybe it already did happen, uh, but it would be our on-demand PD. You can also find it on our site uh, under professional development tab at the top is the on-demand and you can kind of see that piece. Uh, is there a survey that CS recommends to figure out if the staff is on board? Yeah, we have multiple and we're going to be talking about it at that August training, uh, but we just went through one of them. That is an actual survey that you can use. Go back to and create um, to help build readiness. There are multiple readiness surveys. Feel free to reach out and I can share more as well. Once again, john at characterstrong.com. Uh, let's see, what was the 85% quote? It was 75 to 80% of like implementation failures are due to readiness or a lack of readiness <laughs> are due to readiness. <laughs> it's also what Clay talks about of if, if you have 80% of your staff, move, right? If you've built a readiness with 80% of your staff, then you move. You don't have a buy. Yeah, probably. You have, critical, you have critical momentum to move forward. Yep. What happens when your implementation survey shows that there's a lot of work to do? Is some of that included in our curriculum? Yeah, and we're, I mean, one of the things is, yes, we're always just like this, providing more and more resources that don't cost you anything. We're always putting out blogs, podcasts, webinars that are ways, but what do you do if that's the case? Then you don't move on a tier one curricula yet. <laughs> what you do is you keep doing the staff work. You make time for it, right? Conversations, training, hitting the why and the how and the when. That is a part of it. You keep doing it until you see things that are changing in terms of the staff attitudes. You're doing the work one-on-one -on -one and with small groups to change those influencers and get them on board. And then when you see the results start to change, then you know that you're better ready. Because if you implement too early, you only get one chance a lot of times, right? If you're like, if you still think there's a chance that first question, you can rebound, great. But sometimes when it's done really poorly, it could be a great program. And now it's got, it's like a four letter word. And it could take a long time, right, to come back from it. So we got to do that implementation piece seriously and do it well. Practical strategy there, John, is that we have a staff that meets every week and listens to our Character Strong podcast. It's a simple yep. way to cultivate common language. We have a, a teacher who hosts a, a, an optional meeting every week where she puts out the staff character there. Yep. And you start to see some traction of what those behaviors look like and how it starts to change classroom or school culture. And you build on that. And she says, sometimes there's five people there, sometimes there's 30. Yep. Uh, and, and things like that are practical ways with the drip method of yep. um, Focusing on one thing, small, but consistently. Yep, well said. I got to jump off because I'm late, but last one, how do you build administrative buy-in when you aren't the administrator? Mm -hmm. I think there's lots of different ways. I'll just give you two examples. One, have the courage to go in without attacking and just have the conversation. 
here's what I'm seeing. I really feel like this is important. Is there something that we can do? Even having the courage to just have the, just the conversation, right? Curiosity versus like condemnation, right? We're not doing this. Um, the other is who's got the principal's ear? Because there's someone that does. And sometimes we know who that person is. And could we go to them to help them, right? There's sometimes uh, people who the administrator naturally listens to more than others. Can you get to that person to start to change the, the tone or the focus or whatever that might be? That's called extreme ownership is like influencing up. It's understanding that I could keep going, well, our administration doesn't get it. Or I could realize it's on me as much as anybody else to keep pushing and being the squeaky wheel until something, challenge, something changes because I know it's that important. Well, All so right. I got to go, my friend. Thank you, John. To wrap things up uh, on this end, um, join us today at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We're having our, I think our fourth or fifth uh, Twitter chat. If you're on Twitter, um, Krista just dropped it into the chat. Uh, today's conversation is on creating staff uh, and student buy-in. Um, and so go ahead and join us there at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. It's only 17 minutes long, nice and tight. Um, and if you're not on Twitter, maybe you're on Facebook. We have a Facebook educator group uh, where we have people all the time supporting each other and the team is supporting you with questions around exactly this um, type of thing. So we're here to answer those at any time. Uh, the final thing we'll drop into the chat is um, a link to John's email so we can make sure any of your other questions about curriculum on demand. Uh, we do in-building and virtual professional development. We have a couple of virtual trainings coming up and we have all kinds of curriculum to support your needs at school to teach the skills that we know are the plate, not another thing on top of it. Thank you all for being here today. Make it a great day.